First, I'm going to give you the mics once I'm done introducing you. Yeah. Here we go. 
Oh wait, no, someone must switch the scene. Yeah, yeah, yeah thank you all. Mayor, you, can you switch the scene at zero? Oh, which one Bottom bar. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the tournament Q&A is about to start. Please welcome Chiliupi, Dio, you and Crystal, Nyonaro, Half Slash, BTMC, and stand on stage. Epic fail. Good evening, OSU event. This will be the tournament Q&A today, this evening. We've got seven of the biggest names in tournaments joining us today. We're gonna talk a little bit about our experiences with tournaments. We're gonna take some questions from you about stuff you wanna see from tournaments or some things you've experienced. <laughs> We're gonna start off with a few introductions here. We'll start off on the right-hand side. I'll pass the microphone around, give everyone a chance to introduce themselves, make sure everyone is all uh, acquainted with each other here. Hey guys, how's it going tonight? All right, it's time for tournament Q&A. My name is Dio. I, uh, I talk pretty during tournaments. I cast a lot. Uh, most of you probably know me for hosting the Perennial or for being an OWC caster, and I've been staffing tournaments for about four years at this point. Well, hello everyone. Um, Juan Cristal. I used to, well, thank you. I used to <laughs> host the World Cups for about two and a half, maybe three years after Locked Up left in 2017, if I recall correctly. And I've been hosting tournaments for the Spanish community and just in general for the so called mini games, I guess, uh, for many years now. More than I can count, I think. Seven, eight years already. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Stan. I uh, organize tournaments under CES. I've uh, been doing that for like two or three years now uh, and planning on doing, I'll keep doing that. Um, yeah, that's about it. Hi, I'm Half Slashed. Uh, I've been around the tournament scene for probably uh, six years now, and uh, most of you know me for doing the custom mapping for tournaments, especially Course Ace Open, Course Ace Closed. Hello, I'm uh, Nyanaro. You probably know me for my tournament series, uh, most recently Charlie's Perfect Math Class, and I'm also known for uh, doing map pulls. I've been doing tournaments for uh, six years as well. Hello, I am BTMC, aka Ed. I am a, well, more used to be a tournament player, now retired for the most part. Uh, and most recently, I hosted the round table in LA, and uh, it was pretty awesome. Hello, I am uh, Chili Repair, uh, most well known for being the current host of the OSU World Cups, also a co-host of the Perennial and a caster for most community tournaments that you probably watched at one point or another. <laughs> but that's the team. That's what we've got today on stage. Get your questions ready. We're going to have a quick opening question for everyone here. We're going to start off with how you got into tournaments. Maybe something fun, maybe something traumatic that got you into it. You want to start us off, BTMC? Oh, oh okay. Uh, how I got into tournaments. Um, if I were to start as like a player, I was really just trying to find a way to basically legitimize myself as like an actual good player in the, in the scene, where the PB system can only take you so far. But when you actually start engaging in tournaments and, and actually performing well in tournaments, uh, it's more of like a well-rounded skill set, right? Uh, and you actually have like a more like comparative uh, sort of opportunity against specific players, right? So that's how I got into tournaments. However, uh, into organizing my own tournament with the round table, it was really just like a spur of the moment, like, hey, this would be really cool to do. Good morning. Okay. Apparently I have to talk closer. But anyways, um, for the round table, it was really just a spur of the moment thing. Uh, it was Kreutz and Pichy. Uh, we were all just like hanging out. 
and they just thought, hey, we should have something like Smash Summit, but for Osu. I'm like, oh, that would be a cool idea. Let's do it. And then four weeks later, it happened. So, pretty dope. So, I got started in tournaments way back in 2016. Uh, the first tournament I played in was, I believe, an SMT, which had half slash pools. And uh, a few months later, I got uh, into map pooling for Happy Sticks bi-weekly, like these small tournaments. Uh, wasn't until the se wasn't the seasonal tours yet. Those were like the beta version. So it's a uh, simple beginnings, but actual like hosting stuff. Uh, I decided to finally like host my first big tournament instead of like just helping out and staffing uh, in 2018. Uh, like spring with Osu Nordic Tournament. Uh, so yeah, that was cool. Yeah, so uh, I got into tournaments starting off as a player. Uh, I started with uh, Osu Global Tournament 2, uh, ran by uh, some of the, you know, Dutch folk actually, Paddy Yi, if uh, he's still around. Yeah, so uh, did that. Uh, got into this uh, tournaments as a player ever since. Uh, Co-founded uh, uh, these monthly tournaments uh, that Yenro just mentioned. Then uh, kind of ran the gamut on like refereeing, commentary, etc. Uh, dropped off of tournaments uh, to focus on mapping for a while. Then Corsair's Open was like, hey, we want to 100% custom a tournament. And I'm like, okay. So I hopped in that, uh, took that over uh, once we need to actually get it done, and uh, the rest is history. So I started in tournaments back in 2017 as a referee for the Enigmatic Summer Solstice Tournament Series. Pretty old one there. The first big tournament that I actually got involved in was Test Tournament 3, hosted by Cavo as a commentator back in 2019. Everything else pretty much spurred off from there. I now commentate for Corsair's Open, Closed, all those tournaments involving working with Half Slashed and Dio and Juan and everyone else here at least once in my time. Uh, eventually went on to hosting a couple of my own tournaments and uh, after working in that for a couple of years, eventually got invited by uh, Juan over there and Walter to be the new organizer of the World Cups when they decided it was time to step down. Um, yeah, so in 2018, I decided to play my first uh, tournament, which was like a six-digit tournament, uh, STK. And from there, I was like, damn, this is kind of cool, you know? So uh, immediately, I had like this ambition to like make a big tournament. Uh, that immediately failed, because I was like way too ambitious. Um, but. Over time, I've been like slowly trying to uh, get my reputation up again with uh, with newer with newer tournaments, and uh, I'm having a great time doing it. Well, all, all these people that are telling that yeah, I started very old at back in 2017. I'm, I'm sorry to tell you, I, I'm, I started 2014. So 2014 Mania World Cup was my first tournament that I ever played, and I fell in love with just the tournament feeling, that adrenaline as a player that you feel regularly on, on your matches, especially when they are close and they go to tiebreaker and all that fun stuff. And my drive was to replicate that for pretty much any player that wanted to. And I felt that the Spanish community didn't have enough and the mini modes like Osumania, Catch and Taiko also didn't have enough. So I started hosting tournaments for those communities. They enjoyed it and eventually that got me into commentary for the World Cups back in 2015, starting with Mania, and then transitioning to pretty much all the other game modes. Nowadays, only do mostly Mania things. I did host Springtime Osu Mania Free For All Tournament, which is the biggest 1v1 4-key tournament that ever existed. And that's pretty much it. Only helping with World Cups right now, just once in a while, mostly Mania. So uh, I had a pretty similar start to tournaments as most of these other people on stage. Started playing in like 2016, started staffing in like 2018, 2019. Um, so instead of repeating the same story that you've already heard six times, I'm going to talk about why I got into tournaments instead of how. Uh, and the why is that I already loved participating in tournaments. I did competitive speech and debate in both high school and college. Uh, I did competitive policy debate in university for four years, which kept me out of OST tournaments for the most part because those ran on the weekends, as do OST tournaments. Um, but when I got out of university, I 
was still really wanting something competitive to participate in or to organize. And that's when I started really getting into staffing tournaments is because I wanted to fill that same competitive void that kind of left me after I got out of university, after I had no more competitive activities to do. Um, and the experience in speech and debate is also why I started out with commentary as my main form of staffing rather than, you know, map pooling or refereeing or anything like that. All right, thanks guys. So hopefully you enjoyed those uh, quick or not quick introductions. Just as a show of hands, how many people joining us in the audience are either tournament players, tournament staff, or those who want to get into either of the above? So most of you, most of you, some still kind of uh, with the hand halfway up here. Uh, for early disclaimer, I will have the phone with me. We're going to be taking a couple questions from Twitch chat as well. So if you're joining us uh, from Twitch remotely, we'll be taking a couple questions from chat as well as the audience today and make sure we cover all our bases here. So if anyone has a question to start us off, we'd love to uh, answer anything that you might have revolving playing, staffing, anything you wanted to uh, start with. We'll be happy to take it. Any show of hands, or do you want us to pick one? We got one in the front. Any tips for scheduling hell in team tournaments? Who wants to start that question off? That's a big one. Any tips for scheduling tournaments and scheduling conflicts within tournaments? I'll start us off. Um, when in doubt, 15 UTC. Uh, most people will be available for it anyway. If you just tell your team, we're playing 15 UTC, be there, they will probably show up. But in the event when you actually have no way, as from the player's side, if you have no way of really getting it to work out, contact the host, DM the host on Tuesday, like early in the week, so that you don't have this happening on Friday, 12 hours before your match. That's like, from a host perspective, we love that. Please, just DM them and force them to help you. Uh, as someone who's been doing uh, single week in tournaments, I can give a bit of a different answer to that since uh, I'm looking for more of those. So, uh, Scheduling for single week and, uh, of course, the 14, 15 UTC, that would be the normal start. But since they go on for so long, uh, those living in uh, the East will have uh, way too late nights. So there are some ways that uh, I actually haven't even used yet that can circumvent, uh, circumvent that. So one of the ways I've been theorizing is to have time zone regions uh, for a certain portion of the bracket. So you have, let's say, the Americas bracket, the Europe bracket, and the Asia bracket. And then from each bracket, you have uh, a certain number of players qualify to the final bracket, which will then be like the week after at the aforementioned 14 UTC when you can get uh, everyone playing. So there's an answer for your single weekend tournaments for those interested in that. Yeah, for me, I just use Google Calendar. That, that's about it. And if they're like scheduling conflicts, I just like ask them to reschedule to some other time and that's it. So, Thank yeah, you. pretty awesome. I think it goes to show the simple ways do still work. You don't got to go too complicated if you're ever considering hosting a tournament. And I think if there's one thing you should take away today, too, is today is that you don't need to go big scale. You don't need to go crazy, huge, perennial, Corsace, you know, CPMC style tournaments here, or even the round table, an even bigger affair here. We all started from somewhere, so if you wanted to start small, go ahead. Uh, I guess we'll take a question from Twitch chat here, because we saw an interesting one. What is the most difficult part when hosting and organizing a large-scale tournament, and how did you overcome these problems? Map pooling is the answer. I'm sorry, I don't think there's a good solution <laughs> to that problem. Uh, the main struggles as a host, I believe, are, again, like I said, map selecting, but just gathering a group of staff that you're confident can do stuff without you having to be there all the time. If you can find that group, it's like a community effort inside the tournament, and it really helps 
not having to deal with problems at the very last second. For map pool, it depends on your scale. If you go very, very big, like perennial, like OWC, and all these big tournaments that we know, you're going to need a big team, especially if you want to go for custom mapping, if you want to go for custom songs. I suggest maybe 30, 40 people. That's how big you really need to aim for. And in order to have some sort of solution, nowadays we are trying to push for easier access to news posts and different options to gather that people, to have more, what is the world, like uh, when you want to, to showcase yourself a little bit better with advertising. advertising, that's the word, thank you. So we are trying to improve the advertising for co different community tournaments, that should help out, but if you don't have those options, it's about building that team over time. You don't have to aim for an OWC level of scale for your first tournament, you really shouldn't. If you do, it's most likely going to fail. So a couple iterations, gather that group, get good advertising, get a group of people, and it should work out. But there's no real solution to that problem, honestly. Well, you started off saying map pooling was the hardest part of tournaments. Half Slash, did you want to uh, maybe give an attestation to that statement there? Yeah, so uh, map pooling uh, is the hardest for a lot of reasons. First of all, uh, whoever steps up to do that needs to have, you know, like, you know, guns of steel because they are going to have to confront, like, the swaths of the map pool feedback channels. Uh, most eloquently represented by flaming text, of course. Right. So um, the other thing is, uh, uh, even if you get past the initial like skill diversity and like get actually getting the difficulty right and all of that stuff, then some, a lot of the tournaments have been going for custom maps, which then just basically uh, it quadruples to quintuples the size of your map pooling team because you need people finding songs, t figuring out if the songs can make good tournament maps. Then you need like QA for the maps that actually get made. And you also need people hounding the mappers to actually submit things on time. So, and then if you really want on hard mode, you start doing custom songs as well, reaching out to artists such as, uh, you know, like uh, we've had like you custom for uh, OWC 2021 tiebreaker. Uh, Perennial this year had like an undead corporation custom. Like trying to coordinate with a live band is like, oh, next level. So it's uh, that basically you can uh, make this really hard if you really want to. That's all I'm saying there. So it looks like Matt Pools is the consensus here. So get an advanced start on that. We've got the nods from everybody up here. Get started on your Matt Pools sooner rather than later. Any other questions to go? Next up in front. Oh, OK. Uh, so it's more of a tournament question in general. But uh, sorry, I'm really bad at my words. Um, as like a player, how would you? Oops, oh, uh, how do you avoid like self sabotage? Like, let's say if you're working to like improve your skills, like more so like progressing your skill set rather than like just being like negative, like saying you're really bad at the game and then getting like. I think you get the point. Okay. Well, uh, so it's like. Oh, sorry, I'm really. Oh, as a player. Uh, can you get the mic closer? Oh shit! Sorry. Oh. As a player, how would you um, prevent like self-sabotaging? Like, uh, I'm trying to figure out the word. It. Uh, oh, oh my God! So much pressure. Sorry. We got it. We got it. Uh, more like um, like working towards like oh, I'm just gonna work it slowly to get better in the game, rather than like being like like say if you misplay like uh, like oh, I'm bad at the game, and then you just get worse. Like thinking you're really terrible at the game, and how would, instead of thinking you're terrible, rather than moving. Okay, so how do you improve like tournament mentality and improvement and work on uh, continuing to get better at playing tournaments without kind of jumping the gun, I guess, a little bit is what we're going for here. Yeah, so uh, the first thing uh, is practice the map pool. The second thing is uh, try to schedule time zones that uh, you can mentally be there. The third thing is go through the grind and uh, show up on stage and, uh, you know, basically you have to get used to the feeling of actually playing tournaments, playing under pressure, realizing you only have one shot at it. And the only really way to get uh, better at it is to continue throwing yourself at that, right? Um, so, and then as far as uh, practice map pool, some of that goes away with some tournaments since a lot of maps are actually shared between tournaments. So uh, once you play more of the tournaments, you can figure out where you actually need to practice and where you don't. But uh, 
usually at least one run of the map pool to make sure that uh, you know where all the on-site readable patterns are is probably a good idea. So as for like nervousness and pressure when it comes to performing in tournaments, that will never go away. Uh, it's If you think it's going to get better as you play, it's not. Uh, the only thing that's get, that gets better is dealing with it and not like shaking and the, 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 the amount of pressure and how nervous you are, that will never change. It might even go up, but dealing with it and accepting it that, yes, I will be nervous. Just coming to terms with that is the best way to uh, deal with that. So that's an answer for there. Uh, I think the one thing that everyone can attest to is that you cannot control your emotions or you cannot control how you feel in response to different things. But what you can control is your response or how you manage those emotions. So in this case, it's pressure, tournament pressure. It's how can you, uh, can, uh, how can you manage control of yourself as a player under that sort of environment. And for uh, most players, a lot of that comes with just practice. Uh, through practicing map pools, you are more confident. As you are more confident, you're not going to shake as much, you're not going to be as nervous. For other players, it could be the complete opposite, where the more that you practice a map, the worse that you play, or you start to get mind blocked, and then you start to lose more confidence. It really depends on like the player. However, what's really important is that you take the conscious time and the conscious effort for you to discover what type of player you are and what works for you yourself specifically on how to manage those sorts of uh, that sort of pressure. So. Yeah, I have uh, one other thing to add to what everyone else has said is that a lot of other types of people deal with the exact same sort of competitive nervousness that we're talking about in OS right now, specifically for uh, either other tournaments or competitive events or sports events especially and one of the major tactics that people in those situations use to deal with nervousness in competitive situations is having some sort of ritual that they do right before a competitive match starts. Um, for example, when I was doing policy debate in university, we had the exact same phrase that we repeated every single time we were about to start a round. And I know it sounds really silly, but just doing that one thing every single time helps get you into the mindset of being competitive, the mindset of what you are about to do, and helps you deal with repressing the nervousness and calming yourself down and focusing on what is directly in front of you rather than focusing on what could be the end result of that thing. Adding up to that, I think one of those ritual things you really need to incorporate, and I'm not sure if every player does this. I had to deal with this as a as an captain of the Argentinian team in the Mania World Cup many times. And apparently it's not well known that you really should be war mapping before a tournament match. So you really have to do that. I think that helps with the nerves a lot because you're starting to get in the mood, ideally in a multiplayer lobby, to get your offset right in case there's like some fluctuation of the one you're used to. And that really makes a big difference. There has been so many times that I went into a match without warm up and failed miserably. <laughs> like in many of the maps that I was not supposed to miss, I just kept missing. So not only will that shake your nerves a little bit, but it will also get you into the mood of playing that you really need to get to in order to perform well in the tournament. I think uh, mindset is kind of a big component of it, or rather the space that you are in. A lot of players get nervous at different times, and a lot of other players find certain aspects of tournaments much more comfortable than others. You may run into players who would rather play a 1v1 tournament because they like to have control over their scores and the outcome of everything that happens in the match. And you may have other players that prefer team tournaments because they like being able to uh, rely on their teammates and the, the various skill sets that you may have within that group. So certain players will kind of be more comfortable in each situation. The competitive scene for everywhere is different, um, especially being from you know a country like the United States, if you play standard. 
one of the more competitive countries, the most competitive with the overall high level tournament scene, and it provides an interesting environment for new tournament players and those trying to get into things because you have so many people to look up to, so many different skill sets. Um, the all-rounders, the hidden players, your hard rock players, your speed players, gimmick, whatever skill sets you can possibly name off. There's somebody for it and every country's got, you know, their own star. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, people even attending the event this year from the UK, if you've seen Bubble Man walking around, if you've seen Reed Cat, if you're from Sweden, we've got Ed up here, previous OWC participant for the United States. So, you know, whether you've got someone that you look up to or somebody that you strive to be, something that motivates you, that motivation inside is is a massive part of, I think, where nerves come from and how you want to improve and the way that you improve through that, I guess. But. As for that, hopefully that covers everything you needed to know. Any uh, questions from Twitch chat here? There's been a lot of going through here. So somebody asked in chat, do referees with hundreds or even thousands of matches deserve a profile badge for their efforts? And I guess uh, on that question, we can uh, extend it to all staff in general, I guess. If you commit that much time to it, do you deserve a badge for it? I'll take it, I guess, for a moment, if you will. Um, it's a very controversial topic, really. Uh, I think you should reward always your staff with, with whatever ways you can. And I don't think profile badges should be your motivation to be staff at all. But I really do believe that you should be rewarded for it. In any way, really, because it really depends to which tournament it is, right? If you're doing World Cups, then it has been paid compensations. Maybe a badge can also do it, the job. But depending on the context, I think it's most about having the get, getting recognized really by the people who are like on the head of the organization that you are participating is important. Badges is just one of the ways, really. I not so sure if it is the best or the only way. It really depends on the context. Um, so, uh, there already exists a badge that um, gets released every year. Um, I think it was a contributor, right? Um, yeah, so like a couple people each year, they get a badge on their profile for like, um, I think it was Brackets K got, got one? Who, I'm not sure. But someone got like a badge because like they refed so many matches and they like, did so much work for the community. Um, however, my personal take is that there's, it should be distributed to like more people because I think a lot of staff uh, have, get the feeling that they put in so many hours of like their personal life and they kind of like get nothing in return. Um, so yeah, it, that could be like money. But the thing is, the thing is like tournaments are com completely like donated. Like there, there's no like um, money coming in, so it's hard to like give like a money uh, incentive. Um, but it, it would be nice to like get some kind of feedback of like, hey, you're doing a good job, like, you're, you're rewarded for that. Like, some kind of recognition. So, I think, uh, and I guess on an interesting note, uh, Juan and I and Dio and I were actually talking about this uh, at dinner the other night this topic came up, and I think it depends on when you started staffing and playing tournaments, your views on staff recognition. Um, the, I would say the old view of tournaments, or rather the classic view of tournament staffing, is that you did it for yourself, for the enjoyment of it, to give back to the community, to do something that made a difference for other people, for them to enjoy tournaments. And I think that has, you know, I think that's still retained in the current community, but I think the, um, the expectance of um, rewards and recognition comes very early in tournament careers now, if you will. Um, you have staff who have been going for eight months, 12 months, a year, you know, two years that would like badges and all these other forms of recognition for their work. And they certainly do you know, need recognition for what they do, but I think that if you still have staff members in the community who have been here for six, seven, eight, nine years going in the community, 
it's not um, unfair, but it's it, it takes away from what it used to be, which is sticking around for a long time, having people play in the community and staff in the community for long periods of time. You have this constant flow of new people because there is this expectance of rewards for new people, and there's not equivalent rewards being given for those who have stuck around for an even longer period of time. So tiered rewards, something of the like, may resolve any possible issue of that, or, you know, different opinions, but um, definitely to each their own with, you know, again, if it's an older or newer view. Right, so on the topic of badges specifically, uh, badges historically have been a reward, or, or should I rather say prize, for winning a competition. Sure, there's contributor badges, uh, beat map nominator tier badges, and spotlight, but those are, aside from contributor, are fairly recent, and the overarching mentality and perception behind badges as a whole still remains as a prize for winning a competition. Staffing in a tournament is effort, sure, but it's not a competition. You're not competing for a prize, it's work. Right, it's volunteer work, sometimes uh, paid as well, but still volunteer. And that's not something you should expect to receive a prize for. Compensation, maybe, and recognition over a period of time, yes. But as long as badges in the wider spectrum of the community remain a prize from a competition, and if that mentality doesn't necessarily change, then no, of course, we're not going to give badges for referees or map pullers because it's not a competition. Of course, if that mentality changes, then sure. But as of right now, no. All right. Um, I think we're going to jump into a second Twitch question here because we actually have a lengthy but very interesting one that I think everyone might be able to answer from none other than Happy Stick. He asks... With an increasingly large tournament scene and seeing the success of tournaments like the Round Table and Charlie's Perfect Math Class, how do we feel about the future of OSU tournaments? Do what do we think are some of the biggest hurdles that we need to overcome as a community? Uh, I can start with this one. So, when you think about OSU evolving overall into like this esports sort of ecosystem, there's a couple of things that are holding Osu back from that. So first of all, Osu actually has quite a few advantages. Uh, so let's start with those. So one is ping. In other competitive games, the reason we have LAN tournaments is because of lag. Uh, if you go to a fighting game tournament, the reason everyone is in person is because if you make an input and there's a 50 millisecond delay in a fighting game, you can't do that. Same with Osu, but of course, in Osu, we don't care about that, since you're not actually playing with someone in a multiplayer lobby, you're playing alongside them. So that's an advantage Osu has, and that's why we have international online tournaments. So that's really nice. That expands the scene greatly and makes us seem much bigger than we actually are. Uh, but there's also one, let's say, disadvantage, and it's kind of a... Uh, a scary thing. The, the looming threat of like copyright DMCA is always, everyone's always talking about that. There hasn't been a big incident yet, but that's always been around. And uh, it will continue to be around. Even, even with featured artists, there's still some other copyright hurdles, uh, such as beatmap backgrounds and whatnot, that should be cleared, but we're on the right path for that. As for commercialization, that's, if you want to organize a big event, you're going to need a lot of money. And to get that money, you need sponsors, you need uh, viewership, partnered channels, and all that. And Osu does not have a broadcasting studio as of right now, or any kind of uh, firm to mediate sponsorships and all that kind of stuff. All tournaments generally have their own Twitch channel, so a broadcasting studio would be very nice, and we don't have that right now. Uh, so that's one hurdle that we need to overcome. And also viewership in terms of tournament length. So most OSU tournaments right now are uh, six to eight weeks. And 
for a, for a casual viewer, that's a lot, right? E following a tournament every single weekend for eight weeks, being able to keep track where you are in the bracket for any given match. You have to open the bracket every single time and remembering the entire bracket up until that point and what the next matchup is in the span of weeks is just, that's a lot to deal with for the casual average viewer. Like, most of us here are hardcore viewers, so we do that, but for your average Joe who's just watching, that's gonna be hard. So having more single weekend tournaments is better, but that's harder because time zones, and since we're already adapted into this international ecosystem, it just, that's like, being able to adapt to formats like that is just a challenge on its own. I've tried it, and but my brackets are very small and they're not necessarily enjoyable for the average player. It's just an exclusive top player thing. So there's a bunch of hurdles uh, from me. Yeah, so uh, just gonna add a couple things. Uh, one I think one one of the things I think that's really holding things back is that the scope of uh, quality that uh, is being kind of demanded from uh, everyone in the ecosystem, from players to ma to like spectators to hosts, etc., is uh, kind of going beyond like pure volunteer basis. So some form of like compensation is one of the things that I'd say is holding things back because the amount of effort it takes to produce. Uh, some of the quality uh, that we see consistently has definitely outpaced like the amount of goodwill most people can do while uh, still having a life that they uh, are trying to live. So that's uh, one direction. The other thing is actually well, uh, kind of with uh, basically to comment on the whole like single weekend versus you know six to eight week traditional tournament. Um, one of the things is finding a middle ground that actually enables players to like continue to stay in an ecosystem and play tournaments with high frequency versus uh, just having like the spectators. So some balance definitely needs to be found there on the uh, on those boundaries. And of course, uh, then we have the, the sponsorship conundrum. That one is always very very difficult because uh, the pretty much the first uh, doesn't really matter. But it's kind of like chicken and egg problem with a lot of these. Which one of these comes first is a big open question for the community. All right. Uh, yeah, so I agree with most of what's been said so far. I think not necessarily single weekend formats, but it's kind of got to be experimental, right? There needs to be a shift away from this qualifiers into round of 32 format that literally every single tournament does because, my God, is it boring to watch. Like, look at even big tournaments like the Perennial or Corsair's Open, you get literally 10 times the viewership in Grand Finals that you get in Round of 32. Nobody gives a shit about Round of 32 matches. And if you're looking at it from a sponsor's perspective, seriously, why would you sponsor a tournament that is six weeks long and starts with several hundred viewers on the high side? No esports event ever gets sponsored that way. Nobody will care about this game unless we change the format. So that is something that absolutely needs to happen, in my opinion, because, frankly speaking, no sponsor is ever going to want to touch something that gets 300 viewers max for three weeks out of six. Um, and that's, that's basically what it comes down to. I think that's the biggest hurdle, is that unless we make some major changes to the way things are typically run, nobody's going to want to touch it from a sponsorship side. And then, as Haffy was saying, right, the rate of quality and the expectations of quality have completely outpaced what tournament hosts are willing to do for the most part um, because the level of quality of designs that people like Flight and Chillier Pair, who are... Flight definitely is paid for his work for the World Cups. Chillier Pair sometimes paid for his work depending on the tournament. Like, the graphic design quality that they put out is way ahead of what most volunteers will do. So they're, like you were saying, chicken and egg maybe the format changes can induce some extra sponsorships into the game, but uh, unless there's some kind of wave of the hand that makes sure there's some kind of changes that go on, I, I don't see that hurdle being overcome anytime soon, unfortunately. Um, so I know there are a lot of us that are trying to make those format changes, and I think that's a good place to start. So I agree with most of the things that are being said here. I don't necessarily think that we have to go as drastic as a one weekend 
or cut what we already have in half. I think it's a matter of finding this point of equilibrium. I think we are far from it. At some point, us feels feel like it exploded in many different ways, like with custom mapping, with custom songs, with a lot of production value behind it, without any sort of support in terms of financial support, like Dio mentioned, like everybody pretty much has been mentioned. And uh, I'm not sure if the community demanding that is that good of a thing for the tournament scene in general. Of course, you have your right to demand whatever you want, right? But And so do I, right? As a community, as a tournament enjoyer. But I feel the main turtle is trying to find that balance, try to maybe shorten the tournaments or only streaming like the very latest stages. We also have to think that tournaments are not, in my opinion at least, because of how this community feeling is in, in O's. I don't think it's just for the top players or just for the viewership, right? Of course, four digit Mania World Cup exists, for example, or four digit O's World Cup exists, five digits as well. I don't want the tournament scene to miss or lose that community feeling that it started with. And with all this monetization and all this professionalism, I think that's starting to get a little bit away. And it's that's one of the turtles I think is going to be hard to overcome if we even can. And uh, of course, maintaining this level of quality is pretty much impossible as things are right now. Uh, I have a slight counterpoint to that, as those two can very much coexist. Uh, we see this in every other game that has grassroots tournaments. Uh, every single fighting game has, you know, big, you got your Evos and your whatnot, and then you got your weekly, local, small little tournament, and, you know, some country based or something like that. And that can absolutely still work with us, and it will, right? Like, you're not, people want to play in tournaments who, though, who those who aren't top players, and just because the top players get, you know, big professional tournaments, doesn't mean that those not top players will just lose interest in those small tournaments. So there will still be demand for those, and they will coexist. So I don't see that, even though I get what you mean that, you know, the sort of community spirit might be lost to some extent. It will by no means, like, go away or even, like, diminish. It might even increase due to the popularity that these big ones and uh, bring, and then more people will start to do their own little grassroots uh, tournaments. So it sounds scary, but they will coexist. There isn't really... Uh, a threat there. So, just to make sure that we're on the, the same page, this question was about the future for OSIS competitive scene yeah. and the hurdles that it, uh, that it faces and what uh, what we're foreseeing as like ways we can overcome them. Yes, that's right. Okay. So when uh, when I was going through the uh, the organization for the roundtable, um, the reason why we jumped on the idea so quickly and why we decided to like move forward with it so quickly was because not exactly for the whole like oh this would be like huge for the game or, or it would move it forward. What what really stood out to me personally was just that coming from the perspective of a player, right? I'm trying to create an experience that I know that other players would enjoy. I'm not exactly too interested in thinking about the long-term sort of plan. But all I do know is that the long-term will never happen unless someone does something in the present to, you know, pave the way forward for the future, right? There can be a lot of sort of speculation and uh, hypothesizing about what the future of OSU tournaments is going to look like. But the, but the real fact is, is that we already have options to kind of like go in that sort of direction. It's just whether or not people are, people with that sort of, with the resources, with the talent, with the, uh, with, with the capabilities to actually do so, whether or not it's worth their time or 
risk to, to really like move forward with it. So with the round table, like it has many possibilities, or just OSU tournaments in general, they have many possibilities to grow, uh, to, to reach a wider audience, maybe uh, bring in sponsors and bring, uh, have like, like prize pools that are huge, right? That benefits the players, it benefits the recognition for the game. Sure, there are issues that could come up with like uh, copyright or, or various other roadblocks that come along the way, right? But that, it's, it's kind of like, that's bound to happen with any sort of endeavor, right? There, there are hurdles to overcome. It's just getting the ball rolling and seeing where it goes. What I feel is dangerous, though, is a sort of gatekeeping mentality of, well, I, 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 I respect the grassrootsness, right? Um, and I understand the feeling of wanting to keep it as this, like, close, tight-knit community. However, for people who are already established in the game, I feel it is a dangerous mindset to want to keep it that way because the bottom line is that I felt that sort of pressure in a way when I first joined the game. I was viewed as like the, the, the new wave of, of players coming in from, a, from a, a series of players who joined the game around 2007, 2010, right? But now, standing here today, I'm now one of the OGs who joined around 2013, right? And now, all of a sudden, people are now making the exact same argument of, oh, all the people who joined around 2017 through 2020, oh, uh, the, the, they're not part of us. I, I, I feel like that's very dangerous, right? What I want to continue, or what I feel like is the right direction for tournaments in general, is to at least continue paving the way for people of the future who will see these tournaments, who will get inspired to get involved with the game, and then allow them the opportunity to make their, at their own discretion, what they feel like this community should be driven towards. Because at the end of the day, we all joined this game because we thought it was cool. And we, we all do stuff, we all do tournaments because we think it's cool. And we're sharing that with the world. So I don't think it's up to us to really determine or say that the X thing shouldn't happen. If anything, we should just be giving the opportunity that was given to us and just passing that along to, the, to everyone else. I was introduced to this game uh, from one of my friends and I thought it was cool. So I want to share this game with everyone else that I meet because I think they, they would think it's cool as well. That's it. You know, I think um, a lot of people would resonate with that. So true. And, you know, I couldn't agree more. It is, you know, as some of the biggest organizers and most prominent organizers in the game or most prominent community figures in the game, it's our responsibility to keep moving the game forward, like you said, for the next generation that's going to take over after us. There was a generation of tournament hosts and staffs and players that we all looked up to when we were first starting in this game. I remember watching Azer and Happy Stick videos on YouTube many years ago, you know, seeing them play in tournaments and setting scores and being super excited for what was happening or playing in my first tournament and thinking it was absolutely amazing that you could go and compete with someone and show off, you know, show your stuff, show how much you had in terms of skill and, and practice. And now that we're all in the position we're in from starting there, we have to keep moving things forward. And, you know, I guess with respect to my area, I guess the World Cups, that's a struggle that we've always kind of had to deal with is moving things forward as, you know, OWC and all the other World Cups have been the premier community or premier tournament rather for a very long time because it's officially run and supported and funded and staffed um, and you know for a long time we've been receiving complaints I guess to some extent of you know we're falling out of out of style the community tournaments are besting us with their designs their production quality let's be honest Corsais is amazing um, and, you know, Roundtable as well, CPMC, the work that goes into these tournaments is insane. So to step up and to continue moving in that direction, at least from a World Cup perspective, we have to now take that next step forward with everybody. The production quality, you know, it, it doesn't have to be 
in funding, and I think that's the reason we don't like talking about money, is we don't want to gatekeep the community. We want everyone to feel like they can start somewhere. You don't have to be the biggest tournament out there. You don't have to have everything. Start from somewhere, work your way up, and do something you're passionate about. Share what you want to do with your, you know, with this game. The ideas that you have for everyone else, and, you know, propose it to somebody who may have the resources to make that happen or to help you make something happen if you want to go somewhere with your idea so you know never be afraid to keep pushing something if you really want to make it happen we all got here from you know pushing ideas in somewhere forcing our way onto staff teams somehow you had to message someone to get on a staff team eventually so you know keep going with that encourage people to you know try out their ideas keep moving it forward that's that's what we're here for we're going to leave it for the next generation, hopefully better off than we found it. The tournament scene has absolutely exploded and it's kind of just starting, so. But I think we spent a decent amount of time on that question there. Why don't we go back to an audience question here? We've got plenty. Let's see if we can move through a couple here. Uh, what about someone on this side this time? You right in the front there. So, the current tournament scene in O2 consists of lots of standalone tournaments scattered around with no real sense of structure or sense realization. And I wonder if the, you think the scene in the future could benefit from a more kind of structured, centralized, and perhaps even developer supported um, system like a lot of the top esports have. So. Uh, do we have any ideas for ways to kind of centralize the tournament scene around one big, um, you know, tournament ring or something of, of the like? Uh, and I think we we definitely have something to say about this one here. Circle Circuit. <laughs> okay, um, a little more elaboration on that. So uh, we basically have realized that uh, a lot of the tournament hosts kind of work independently, and yet at the same time they support each other uh, in quite strongly. So, uh, for example, Dio Chillier pair have a significant presence in uh, courses as uh, commentators, refs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, you know, and same thing with like Yaze. Yaze has kind of like refed every tournament for like the past like six years or something. Uh, so we have all this like the partnerships, right? This one guy hosting a bunch of stuff, a lot of the same stuff, like staff were helping out with his tournaments, he's commentating for them, scheduling for them, dealing with those crazy conflicts we were just talking about earlier. Um, so I just realized, hey, why don't we just like work together in one place? So essentially that's kind of what we've done with Circle Circuit. But the issue with Circle Circuit is kind of uh, everyone's so busy with their tournaments and kind of moving them towards like these higher standards of production quality that they don't really have the time to actually put into the or Circle Circuit or if itself. So kind of the biggest hold up there is who is actually willing to kind of like drive it forward, who has the knowledge and isn't working on their own like passion project, right? So that's kind of where that's going. Uh, and But as an, a single entity, right, uh, the idea here is you can kind of like get sponsors to like look at these like array of high quality and varied tournaments, right? And uh, you can also set standards with the community, right? There's a lot of community spaces uh, in Circle Circuit. But again, like it needs uh, some leadership to actually drive that forward. Yeah, uh, that it pretty much sums up where we're at regarding centralizing the tournament scene a bit. I think there's so much that could be done if one of us could put the personal project aside and just work on Circle Circuit, but like either, that's the problem with tournament hosts is that none of us are here because we're bored of tournaments and we just kind of half-ass it while we're actually working on the tournaments, right? We're here because we're passionate about the tournaments that we want to work on and we want to keep making them better and better. So like none of us willingly put our stuff aside just to work on other things because these are the tournaments that we have put so much work into. So the reason these hosts usually leave the scene isn't because they've just like decided one day to stop. It's because over a very long time you lose interest in it or you move on or life happens and you just don't have the time for it anymore. So finding somebody who not only has the knowledge but is also active enough and 
like knows enough about the scene and has the time for it all at once is very hard. Um, it almost wasn't even going to happen this year until I just said, you know what, I will just force this thing to move a little bit <laughs> and forced it to happen. But um, we're going to keep trying to expand it little by little. I don't think it's going to be a very quick push into it unless we can get some involvement from some outside sources, which we're definitely going to look for um, after the end of season tournament for this year. Hopefully we can get some other people involved in it. Hopefully we can expand it into lower rank range tournaments. Also just make a kind of newer hub for tournaments. There is already a tournament hub, by the way. There is a server called OST Tournament Hub, which exists, which has been around for years, which has other admins who already exist for it. Uh, yeah, like I don't, like half a decade or something. You can find tons of staff for your own tournaments there. There's a whole feed of new tournaments that constantly gets posted in there looking for new staff, which is also a great place to like find a first tournament to staff for, right? There are literally feeds of tournaments every single day getting posted looking for staff. So if you want to start out somewhere, look there first. Um, but I think some of that centralization has already been done, like with OS Tournament Hub, and some of it is in the works with Circle Circuit from an organizational standpoint for both some of the bigger tournaments and extending that probably to custom mapping at some point is something that we also wanted to do. So this is something I think we discussed as well a little bit while we were having dinner yesterday. Um, I think it's not only just about centralizing, which is think that good. I think it's a good thing, but this centralization might produce something that improves this issue that we all seem to have, that is accessibility to some tools that maybe some smaller organizers don't have. For instance, the other day, uh, well, this was not the other day, it was like three years ago, really, that we were hosting Soft with Halogen, uh, a Forky Mania tournament that I talked about. And we wanted to do a website for it. We thought it was a cool idea, some production value that we never have seen like in Mania before. But it really takes a long time. And I feel with some centralization between not only just standard, but maybe different modes and pretty much as much input as possible, we could just create a tool that facilitates those tasks that really takes a lot of time of hosts and people who are working in a tournament that frees up space for you to do the other things that you can't really automate or do anymore, like map selecting, like customs, etc. So if the centralization can produce those tools, that will be great. I, I hope you, you have some plans for that because that will be neat. I can actually say something about that uh, already. There, in the tournament hub that exists, there is maybe not website builders, maybe not like lots of map poolers who are willing and able to help at the moment, but from the back end side of hosting, for example, for spreadsheeting and for using tools like that, that part is infinitely easier. It's solved. It's, it's done. You have map pooling templates that automatically pull data from the website using the OS API when you just put a link to the beat map in a row of a spreadsheet. Like, this problem is, that problem is largely solved from the back end side. I agree, though, in terms of like getting staff together, getting map poolers around, getting custom mappers largely shared between a lot of tournaments as well. I think that kind of extra access to resources would be a very good thing to get out of the centralization because as it stands, a lot of the custom mappers are either referred between a bunch of the same people or just on application basis only, which definitely has its downsides. I think Dio has covered it uh, pretty well. So if you want to go maybe check out Circle Circuit or the Tournament Hub or you know any of those resources, there's plenty of things out there for you know new hosts and even existing hosts to have access to now. And hopefully you know in the, in the coming years, there's going to be more ways to get exposure and staffing and all of this kind of uh, situated. But I guess we can take another audience question again. Let's keep going with this. <laughs> Let's take a let's take a question from Mr. Ryusei Aiko back here. Okay, thank you. So my question is: uh, Recently, I have seen a saying about the tournament itself, but it's kind of negative because the saying is more like 
one trick player will get more recognized than the tournament player. So basically they are saying like one trick larger than being made at everything. And there are some complaints about, for example, if I am not being keep want to play like six star HD2 or stuff like that, I will probably be more recognized. So I think that is kind of a negative mindset. And I want to know you guys, do you guys have like anything that want to say to these people? Like how to make sure that they won't get like way too depressive or feel they are not recognized by this kind of mindset. Thank you. So uh, I guess a question for the commentators and us all here. The uh, issue of focusing specifically on, you know, kind of one trick players versus all rounders in tournaments, um, I guess providing, you know, kind of extra recognition for those who play one skill set exceptionally versus, you know, everything as a whole being that amazing tournament player top level. Yeah, uh, before I hand it over to Dio, uh, basically what I, the, what I have to say on that is, so it, especially when you watch like some of the higher levels with like the super teams, like in the Corsi's Open, Perennial, um, you have a lot of players that can be considered all-rounders, and it's kind of weird in the sense of like being like these top-level all-rounders, if you're performing kind of average, it kind of like makes it a little bit easier for the one tricks that perform super well and put up a high score on one thing to uh, stand out more. This is just about contrast, right, in that sense. So I guess I, guess I do kind of agree that it's a little unfair in that sense because it's like they're only in for one map. They perform well in that one map. Uh, for example, like we put in Arison for DT2 uh, on USA OWC, right? He nearly assesses the map every time. And then it's just, but like that's the only thing. Meanwhile, it's like you look at like a player like Fancy Lad, Utami, they're out there and they are, you know, putting up 500k minimum, uh, sometimes getting FCs on all of the rest of the maps because they're well-rounded. So I guess uh, probably what, what that comes down to is like their hit re reputation. It's kind of a, a communication challenge in that these players are kind of assumed to be well-known enough that they have this like, people know that they're good at everything, right? Like people know like Vaxe can put up 800k on basically every map at any range minimum. Uh, and uh, there should probably be a little bit more focus uh, on that. I wanted to grab this anyway. Yeah. Um, I think also it depends a lot on the type of tournament that you're watching. For example, in 4v4 tournaments, I think that's the one trick's place to shine. Like in 4v4 tournaments, that's where they have a really easy chance of making a big difference because especially as you get into the later stages of these tournaments where the super teams tend to be the only ones left at the end and the star rating gets a little bit ridiculous, that's where the one tricks have the easiest time showing off because they don't have to be in for every map. They don't have to play all of those picks that they're bad at. And while the all-rounders kind of get pushed to the background a little bit in 4v4s, I think in 1v1 tournaments, that's their place to shine. Because you don't see one tricks getting into the grand finals of 1v1 tournaments anymore. They just don't, because you need the well-rounded skill set to really get there at the end of it. Um, I think another thing that happens a lot is people oftentimes pay really close attention to commentary during a map. Like, while the players are actually playing something, there's a lot more focus on what's going on on screen. And in between maps, a lot of people tend to tune out a bit, but that's where, oftentimes, as a commentator, you want to talk about the all-rounder. Because it's not that the all-rounder is making a big, flashy performance that you want to point out during the map. It's that their quiet performance and their quiet steadiness all throughout has been enabling these one-tricks to win them the maps later on. So oftentimes, when things slow down, when you have some downtime, that's when the focus gets put onto them. And is it a little unfair? Yeah, maybe. But you don't see the one-tricks at all in 1v1, so the all-rounders have their time to shine there, for sure. Uh, as Dio said there, of course commentary is supposed to be, you know, flashy and all that, and if the one trick is flashy in that moment, that's what they're going to be focusing on. So, that's cool, but there is another avenue than commentary where these all-rounders can get uh, their recognition, and that is in post-game stats. So, uh, in post-game stats, usually they're, you know, maybe the highest score will have a bold, but I think it would be really cool if in post-game stats, you would have um, 
there, there's often also like a like a performance thing, you know, like a point system or whatever. But I think most maps played, and then you have like who played the most maps because that is usually indicative in team tournaments of who is the best all rounder. So that kind of I don't know who, if I think tournaments do do that those those stats, but just having those higher up or more uh, in a more, more higher standing uh, would be a nice way of uh, giving recognition to the all rounders. So. Most maps played as a statistic, advert, you know, marketing that, and uh, you know, maybe in future matches, giving commentators giving, yeah, this this guy played the most maps in this previous match, so this is definitely the strongest player of this team, you know, giving that as a maybe like a before the match begins, as like, yeah, look out for this player. This player is going to be in all the maps. This this player is crazy, super consistent. So that could be a great way to give recognition to those. So yeah, there you go. I think this is often talked about as kind of one of the main issues, or rather, um, like kind of stale points of OS commentary, is that it's very difficult to not commentate exactly what's happening on your screen for a lot of commentators. A lot of, you know, those who come up on stream, this player missed, this is the roster of the map, this is what they picked because they play this skill set. It's a very matter of fact way of um, commentating, and I guess, and uh, you know, another fellow commentator of mine, T1G, would be proud of me for using a sports reference, but if you uh, reference, you know, kind of, if you watch sports or even any, any other, you know, even just the Olympics and, and athletic events, there is so much more to go off of because there's a lot of factors that play into being skilled at a top level in terms of competitive performance, and you know, I think commentary needs to shift in a way that we focus more on the aspects of a player that maybe make them good at that skill set or why certain things happen. There needs to be more analysis, and I think that's often skipped because the game is so fast-paced. Everything happens at once. There's no instant replays, at least no tournaments have done that yet, hopefully. Fingers crossed soon, maybe, something. Um, you know, but some way to look back at maybe you know, and, and I think LAN events would be great to see for this because you get the player perspective, you get to see the keyboard, the tablet, the mouse, all of that, and you can see, oh, re, you know, reposition, the, the pen slipped, or they moved their hand too far, or I don't know, they weren't sitting up straight in their chair. Some little mannerisms that you can see when you have a physical view of what's going on rather than just the gameplay that's on the screen. So. You know, I think there's different ways that this problem can be remedied, and I think right now the biggest way we try and do that is through statistics and previous performances, and that's basically all commentators have to go off of right now. So it is a commentary limitation. It's something that needs to be worked on by most commentators or tournaments. It's certainly not an impossibility, but um, you know, maybe a little effort goes a long way. That little prep and you can tell the good commentators that go and prep statistics and information beforehand, you notice their commentary over those who kind of just pick up a match and go. And it's the difference between kind of the top level commentators and, you know, the more casual, I guess I would say, who kind of just commentate because they enjoy it. Uh, I'd like to add to that that I definitely agree with uh, Chilia Per. Hype casting in Osu is. It's less valuable than it is in other games because when someone misses an Osu, you say, "Oh, they missed." Like, yeah, everyone, yeah, everyone, everyone got that. But in another game, it might not be as obvious to the casual viewer, and the it's important, more important for the commentator to point that out. But Osu, there's a lot going under the hood. Uh, you know, the design of the map, what's coming next in the map. That's pretty. That's always a nice thing. So instead of a focusing. Uh, Oh, this player's doing really good and setting up yourself for a commentator curse, which is always hilarious. Uh, you can say, "Oh, next is a hard part coming. Be ready for misses." And then when it comes, you look like a genius because that's the hard part. The viewers were ready for it. So, talking about the map design, you know, saying, "Oh, this mapper is known for using these kinds of patterns," and then you have, then let's say one of those patterns comes up. Uh, you say, "Oh, that's the one," and the viewers notice that, and it's it's a nice. You're you're having like a one-sided conversation with the viewer, and they can, you know, it's like a form of interaction. So, analysis in that way is much more valuable in Osu because 
hype casting in and of itself is less valuable due to events going on being so obvious and the stuff that's under the hood being much less obvious. So again, as Chillier said, focusing more on that ana analysis is extremely valuable, and I do wish more commentators uh, did that. Y you know, what, what you mentioned about the, this sort of prep, not just on the players being our randers or being one tricks or whatever, but also knowing the map is very important. Like, playing the map pools as a commentator is something that is very beneficial. You can really tell the difference between someone who knows when the hard part is coming and when it's not. Mania is a perfect example. If there is any player that is side reading a map with any sort of slider velocity change, you will instantly notice. And if you're prepared for it, you can call them out and it gets to the viewer and they enjoy it. All the ma minor things that I think most commentators should be pointing like when someone is hitting late or someone is hitting early, how does that affect performance? If it's nerves, if it is because of offset. In Mania it's also clear because some people maybe change their scroll speed and you notice that and you point that out. Like that's what makes the difference, I think, between the, the graders and not like more casual commentators, as you said. But the main issue, which I think was the, the, the point of the question, right, to distinct the all-rounder from like the one trick in general, Again, if we do sports analogies, when a team is playing, let's say, a football match, they win 1-0, to zero, the star is going to be the striker who scored the goal, and it will come down at the end of the day to probably the last map that was played, be that streams, be that aim, be that whatever it was, and that's most likely what's going to be remembered, but us as commentators, we should work on trying to showcase not just the winning team, but also the team that didn't get to win, what they did, what they prepped, and well, the audience then can judge whatever they want. They probably just remember the final moment. We all remember, for instance, the tiebreaker between China and the United States on 2015, a big explosion. And we all remember that moment when Toy failed for a second and everyone was super nervous. But in reality, it was mostly just the other players that were like, holding 500 combos and nobody was really noticing, right? So, you, you can see one of those videos and see the commentary now and see how much it has improved over the, over the days as well, and that's important. I think the signal of improvement is there and I think it's, it's getting better with time as well. Uh, to actually uh, go off of uh, what Juan said there, I think a great way to illustrate a lot of uh, what Juan just said there is to have post-game interviews. Just I ask love the that. players I love them. straight up, like, is there anything interesting that happened during the match? And they might say something funny. There's a good chance that they'll, you know, maybe, you know, a pen, you know like a pen slip, or, or, you know, they change scroll speed, or something like that, and, uh, oh, I forgot to change skin. Oh, oops, I put background dim on zero on this map earlier, because I was playing the bit with it, it with video on, and then I forgot to change it back, you know. Those are always funny, and getting those explanations is, you know, it's it's a nice viewer experience. And of course, hearing the players' thoughts on the match is uh, great. So having post-game inter interviews would be a great addition. Agreed. So, Dio, did you want to uh, maybe talk a little bit about post-game interviews? I know uh, Perennial was one of the first uh, couple tournaments to use that. Yeah, we did those two years in a row. They were great. Um, I like post-match interviews. They're very cool. Um, I think there's a challenge in post-match interviews in that if it's the same caster casting the match and doing the interview, you tend to go into it with very little prep. So they kind of sucked last year when we did them in Perennial, I'm not going to lie. Um, but this year they were way better. I brought in this one guy just to do interviews in the finals and grand finals. And he was awesome. He like took notes the entire match and had a bunch of the questions prepared and talked with like Fiery Rage and Bartek a ton especially after the matches and Bartek's interviews especially were hilarious. Go back and watch some of those when we upload the VODs because they are actually so funny. Um, but yeah, post-match interviews in particular, very good point, are really fun to watch a lot of times and definitely give you a little bit more insight into like pick band process, thought process, because sometimes as a caster you're sitting there like, oh yeah, they totally like hyper analyzed this pick and picked this for a specific pattern and they're like, no, we had no idea what to pick. We just like rolled in Discord and <laughs> picked the map because of it. So uh, sometimes you get some really unexpected answers. It's very fun. Awesome. Well, 
that's, uh, I guess, the first big commentary question we've had so far. Uh, before I go up and take another question from the audience, or maybe even from Twitch chat, is there anyone that has any questions on maybe streaming and production and all of the uh, kind of back-end work that goes into tournaments? I saw a hand go up in the back first. It would be, it would be nice to have a certain someone here to answer those questions. You know what I mean, Chile. <laughs> So, what kind of features would you like in uh, the tournament client, like new features? So, we've got a question about the tournament client and about features that we would like implemented. And I guess uh, this kind of goes for every area of commentary here. <laughs> you, give, give, that, give that a chance. Um, well, first of all, I mean, the laser tournament client is uh, still like in production and everything. Um, and the re right now, we have like to do some janky ass setup where we have the laser tournament clients open and then the old tournament client, which is also kind of broken because those stupid screens won't like, m won't like hide if you alt tab them. So you have to do like some janky ass setup. So first of all, I want to see um, laser get uh, released, uh, right? Well, I mean, yeah, released. Um, so that we can finally have like actual spectating within the laser tournament client, because it will just make the streamers and hosts and everyone's life so much easier. Dude, I just want a tournament client that works most of the time. That's. I'm talking about. You are so right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> just to elaborate on that, so it's not totally memed. Um, basically. The, uh, when you try to actually like commentate a match or even like stream a match, uh, I'd say that you can probably get through about 10, maybe, maybe like one in uh, seven matches is going to have some critical banjo error. Something is going to mess up, like a player is going to be like paused and force everything else to like catch up or because of the way that the disconnection stuff works. I don't know. You've seen a tournament, you know what I'm talking about. Hard to explain in a uh, few words. I'll say that. What was what was the weirdest thing you have seen for the tournament client do? I think uh, if I had to go off of memory here, um, we thought like a player disconnected, and I think they like reconnected, and it played through probably half the map, but the map was in, like nearly four map minutes long, so it was two minutes of single player uh, with like the fourth player there in the corner um, until everyone else played. And then it's like you still had to deal with like the Bancho missings and stuff. And then of course obviously the score reporting was completely broken after all of that too. So uh, you had like gigantic miscounts that were completely disconnected. Like the person I think maybe missed once or twice and got like 700k. But it showed like they got like 150k in like three, like 30 misses or something crazy. I don't know. Like there, there have been, we have seen some stuff. You see, uh, before you pass the mic. My favorite moment for the tournament client is it was a thing during either Mania, I think it was Mania World Cup, and a player started playing catch in the middle of the match. Like it was seven screens playing Mania, one playing catch, and it wasn't even the same song. It was just something different. The catcher was just standing there, the fruits were falling, and nothing else. That was the most hilarious thing I have ever seen. And it, it shows how much it's improved. Like you are complaining about it, and I understand. I, I agree with you. It needs to improve a lot. But back on, back in my days, things got really, really crazy. Ooh. Uh, my favorite weird event at the tournament client has to be how there are version differences in how mods work. So in stable tournament client, everything is you know as is. But in cutting edge, uh, they. They have almost fixed this, but halftime actually plays at normal speed, and it like cuts back every few seconds. Uh, it's so that's that's why I still use stable uh, <laughs> for my tournaments because I, I do have halftime picks sometimes. Uh, but as for the question of uh, new features, ooh, I would really like uh, settings to be uh, saved more. So having storyboards, uh, skins on both sides. You know, you can have different skins and you can have a nice menu background that blends in, that's nice, and videos saved and all that. Uh, I actually had something else, but I got caught with my halftime. So yeah, go ahead. Oh, stats banner. Well, that, that can be 
overlaid, but it would be nice in the actual client. But yeah, Dio, go ahead. Yeah. Um, in the stable tournament client, there's a field where you can enter custom text for during warm up when the stars disappear. That field is still there on the cutting edge client, but the text doesn't appear at the top. It just leaves it blank and removes the stars. And I have zero idea why it's not there, because it's there in stable and it's not in cutting edge. So just like adding that in would be a great start to some changes. Um, definitely think like saving skin changes on the right hand side of the tournament client would be really nice. Um, one other thing that I'd really like to see for tournaments that don't want to deal with laser setup because if, if you manually set up the laser client and you do everything that OWC does, including entering in qualifier results, it can take you like 15 hours to manually enter everything. Like if you don't have a script to do it that runs custom on your computer, it can take you over 12 hours. So if you don't want to deal with that and you're just using like normal tournament client, I want to see GIF backgrounds added in to the tournament client. Like if you could still have an animated background on the cutting edge or stable client, I think that would be really nice and it would help a lot with um, like making nicer production value a bit more accessible to the average tournament host who doesn't want to put in that massive amount of time using laser or learning how to code their own custom program with go to memory either, right? So, yeah. You can actually add features to the laser client right now if you know how to code. But like, if you're not aware of that, it's something you can do. But if there's one thing I want to see happening is for that not to be necessary, right? At this point, we are in the need of many things that we want to customly add, and right now it's not very accessible to do. And it mostly has to do with the fact that it's not like fully released yet. But there's a lot of things you, you can do if you know how to code. We have done that for, for many community tournaments already as well, uh, just in case you didn't know. And, but the main thing really is moving that tournament client to laser, I think. That would be the one, number one thing that should be done as soon as possible. Uh, uh, just quickly, I remembered a nice uh, feature I won in the tournament client. So right now, uh, hit sounds are only on the top left uh, Clients. So if 1v1 is just the left one and teams on the top left, I want stereo hit sounds. So everyone gets hit sounds in different audio channels. That would be so cool. I want that. And also just like random like quality of life changes. Like in the laser tournament clients, I don't know why, but like if you click a button, there's like no feedback at all. So like you don't even know if it like if it worked. And the first time I like worked with the laser client, I was like, am I doing this right? And apparently it worked, but it was like. I just like I had to trust it, and it was really hard to do that. Yeah, when you save stuff, like yeah exactly, saving it. <laughs> so I guess we've been doing a lot of talking about uh, you know kind of the the stable and, and cutting edge tournament client here, and you know laser is being used more often as a tournament client now than it has before because features are slowly being fixed being modified as the client is starting to become a little bit more polished. It's becoming more intuitive to use. There's these little kind of quality of life updates that have been coming out, whether or not it's, you know, mass importing information or things being displayed a little bit more accurately, the client grabbing chat and windows and everything. And, you know, laser is, is starting to hit a point where it's ready for tournament play, not necessarily even just client side, but uh, gameplay wise so you know I, and I didn't want I, I guess I'm not really spoiling anything here besides for some of the players but uh, if you do catch some of the show matches or the actual 1v1 tournament that we have running at the event this year um, we'll actually be using Osu laser for the gameplay uh, in each of those different events so I guess to kind of showcase the actual capabilities of the client now how much work has been put into it um, you know how much more polished it is in terms of production and gameplay. Uh, you know you're all going to get a pretty good look at you know what the client has to offer now and all the big improvements and changes that have you know been made there. So, in terms of features, I think as long as the tournament client does its job and actually displays like everything properly, I that's the bare minimum of what we can ask for. However, if we were to take it one step further, I really think the viewing experience 
could actually be improved because of the fair, like a common criticism I see about the Torment client, uh, especially from a viewer, is that it's hard to focus on eight different screens at once. Right? So when I take a look at like other tournaments like Counter Strike or something, they're always showing like one person's perspective, right? Um, or usually it's like a person who's about to be in like some sort of action. I'm not sure if there's the infrastructure for it yet, but it's something that we experimented with with the round table where we would have, okay, uh, it's a one versus one. Everyone's obviously looking at this one person because uh, they're full comboing and the other person isn't, right? Well, they get the full combo. So we switch it to a first person perspective where it's literally their live game view with their face cam and all, right? And I feel like that's something that a lot of people really enjoy, right? Um, the, my question is what, like, or my, my thought process is if there could be a sort of view mode for the tournament client to basically select players in a lobby and highlight just their perspective and then have like their, their teammate score on the side and then the other team score on the side, I think that would be a much more easily digestible viewing experience. However, I, overall I think the, the, oh, the viewing experience of the tournament client could be refined at the very least. I've actually thought about that before, like having variable team size be an option on a tournament client. For things like, uh, for example, Battle Royale tournaments also, it would be really nice to be able to have variable team size, but you could, if that functionality is possible, you could probably get it so that you select either one player or you select like a starting window to get it to display like what you're talking about, just that one player and then have everybody else either just scores listed off to the side or something else just to keep track of things. But yeah, I think it's a really, really nice functionality to have because there's, especially with uh, Battle Royale tournaments and other variable formats that we've been seeing get more popular in the mainstream tournament scene, I think the standard tournament client as it is is actually a little bit outdated in terms of the viewing window. Yeah, that would actually be really nice. I'm doing a 1v3 show match on stage tomorrow, so it would have been nice a one and then three on the other. That would have been uh, great. Thanks for bringing that up. That is actually a variable team size would be awesome to see. All right. So I guess uh, that, that covers the client a little bit, at least here for us today. Um, I think we have time for one more question here, maybe? So we'll do one more question from the audience here. Whoever can raise their hand the highest, I'll pick first. You raised your hand higher first. You won the race. Um, okay, uh, considering that the uh, low rank tournaments are getting uh, much like more common these days, uh, what do you think about this six and even seven digit uh, tournaments when players like shouldn't uh, be that focused on certain skill sets and maybe like try to get the, like the general grasp of the game more? All right, so what uh, what do we think about six and seven digits or rather uh, lower ranked players focusing on tournaments rather than just improving fundamentals when they first start? Yeah, so uh, skill set variety, uh, okay. So we even have this issue with like, high, like open ranked tournaments when they start out at too low of a uh, star range for the maps. Uh, when you get low on those, uh, uh, basically, skill sets really start to blur. And so you kind of get, with like those lower bracket tournaments, you get the experience that's more akin to like playing tournament pools in 2013, 2014, where it's more of like the pools end up being more structured around like the songs that people like to play, um, which is kind of fun and all, but uh, it's not really like the top tier competitive experience that you're trying to like go for with like honing in skill sets, because it just doesn't really exist unless you're going to have like the seven digits trying to place like six and a half star maps and getting like 100k, 50k on them, right? So um, I think there is like a practical limit for skill. That said, the game's population is growing, right? When I was five digit, like it basically mid five digit 
was considered what six digit is now and so like those maps go surprisingly high right i think i saw uh my i think they go to like what 6.5 in the grand finals for six digits so uh there is some sort of skill set delineation but it only really appears in the finals and grand finals and uh I, overall, I, I don't know. I, I don't know how I feel about it. I definitely can't take them seriously for, like, competitive. However, I think that, like, just having tournaments out there for just for people trying to get the experience of playing the game in that way is totally fine. I think, um, so in, in fighting games, uh, a lot of local tournaments have what is called a Phoenix Bracket. So those who get eliminated early on, let's say don't qualify and still want to play, um, they'll often have... A like a side tournament specifically for those who got eliminated early or didn't qualify. So, for example, for an open rank tournament, let's say uh, Corsace, those who are perform in the qualifiers like the lowest, you know, they could have like some kind of uh, you know side bracket just for them with easier pools. That I think in tournaments overall, if there's demand for such a system, would be really nice to be implemented. So that way. Uh, you know, these uh, less skilled players who still want to compete can compete in this... In still compete in this big tournament, but in a sort of side bracket, in a ecosystem sort of suited for them where they can still experience this, you know, competitiveness but not necessarily have those high stakes um, that exist in uh, the main tournament or the main bracket. So I'm going to... I have like a slightly different interpretation of the question I guess um, if you're interpreting the question more along the lines of like can six digits and seven digits play tournaments and can there be competition yes there can there, the map pools like half slash said are going to be a little less balanced in terms of skill set and the bracket is going to be obviously less competitive than an open rank tournament because that's the definition of it being a lower rank tournament but um, I think Part of the reason why a lot of people tend to like look down on six and seven digit tournaments, and there is a bit of a stigma in the tournament community around them, I will say that. Um, but I think part of the reason that stigma exists is because lower ranked players have way easier of a time developing their skill sets if they don't play tournaments. I know that sounds weird coming from the dude who hosts like big tournaments and commentates everything, right? But like. Tournaments gap your skill cap. They really do. Um, they are more so a test of where you are currently than a way to improve. And if you spent all that time instead of practicing map pools on focusing on improving your skill cap and farming and getting better at the game, you will actually end up being a better player in the long run than if you widen your skill sets right now as a six digit. Um, so what I will say is if you do want to play tournaments as a lower ranked player, that's fine. But you better be comfortable with where you are in terms of your rank and your skill cap. Because if you're not, you may get frustrated trying to improve with how much time it takes to really invest into tournaments and practice the map pools and all that jazz. And I've, I've certainly found that out the hard way as well as somebody who has been hard stuck 5k for six years. Uh, about six digit and seven digit tournaments. I personally think they are the wrong approach to to tournaments. Like, if you're a low digit player, I don't think you should be playing tournaments, but rather matches, if that makes sense. At some point in time, I don't remember what it was or how it was called, there was some sort of bot that you could, like, play games. Like, made by. Yeah. That you could play games with people and that was like you had this thrill, this experience of okay, I'm actually playing a competitive match. This is this will affect my elo or whatever that system for like ranking you was. I think those kind of things are better ex like short experience for for lower ranked players in general, and that will get you through the feeling, through this adrenaline, to these moments that tournaments create. But you really, if, if you're into that, and if you like it, then you start working on your skills and try to develop them to enter into all the tournaments that are more competitive and therefore more... I don't want to say serious, because I don't think serious is the right word, but that are more ironed and they make more sense. Like a six-digit or seven-digit map pool, as it was mentioned multiple times, just not going to cover skill sets really well. It's mostly going to be like 
songs that you like or dislike and that's about it you can make maples for like easier maples in general but most of the time it's not gonna be very balanced so for the thrill for the experience I think if we can go back to that it would be nice for a starting point and then work on your skills improve them enter into some open rank tournaments maybe at some point if you want to test your skill like Dio said a rank restricted like a four digit or maybe even a five digit well as you probably all know I don't think five digits are badgeable at the moment five R okay that's the bottom okay yeah uh, well that that's like I think the the entry point that you should aim for after getting those uh, those first experiences with those kind of competitive environments that are shorter and it, they let you experience the thrill of it um, so I think because Osu right now is expanding like crazy um, like there's it's basically exponential how fast it's growing um, so like a couple years ago right the top like maybe 80k uh, right now would be like low 100k right so I think there's definitely room now for six data tournaments um, I wouldn't say that they're they're becoming like uh, they're gonna be like competitive but I think it's definitely a great way to like get into playing tournaments and like getting comfortable with kind of like knowing what it is um, as far as seven data tournaments goes I've I'm, I've had some experience with uh, dealing with seven digits in tournaments and generally it's it's not a great time. I mean, usually like the mentality, it, it, it varies per person, of course, but I've seen overall that seven digits are kind of like new to the game um, and it, it's kind of harder to deal with because they don't really know like uh, what everything is or like what they're doing. So I think six digits is now like a pretty good entry point uh, for tournaments. So even if you're a low rank, there's something for you. There's some way to get into the tournament community if you do want to get into. I think that's a good thing about this game. You can start from the bottom line and do something you enjoy, have fun with it, take part in a little competition and work your way up the line. But I think that's the last question from us for tonight. We hope you've all enjoyed the panel. If you have questions following, I'm sure anyone here would be happy to answer if you wanted to come up and ask. But uh, from us, for now, <laughs> Poon wants to say something first. Yeah, I just want to thank everyone for tuning in and following COE22 uh, stage events. Uh, I just want to announce our next event that is going to be uh, the OS Dev Talk tomorrow at 14. Don't miss it because it's actually the only time you will be able to see Pepe at COE this year as he will be virtually presenting from Japan. Thanks everyone for tuning in and see you tomorrow. Thank you.